Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Friends, welcome back to this 21st lecture, which is the last lecture in this series on human behavior. Now, what we are going to do in this lecture is we are going to review what we have done in this past 20 lectures. This lecture is going to be a brief lecture. Why? Because in all the previous lectures, what I have been going through is I have been trying to cover up where we started and how did we reach in any particular lecture. So basically I will be covering up my grounds right from lecture number 2, lecture number 1 being the first lecture. So there is no reason of covering a ground but from lecture 2 onwards to lecture 20 I have been reviewing what we have done before. Of course these reviews were not detailed so I thought I will dedicate this lecture to reviewing what we have done and how it all makes meaning whatever we have done up till now makes meaning in the sense that uh, how we did or what we did up till now, how does it justify a course on human behavior. So this lecture although brief will try and make sense of what we studied in, the, in all these lectures including a review of what we have done in all the present lectures and give you an overall picture of the science of human behavior. So we started our journey some 8 weeks back by introducing this course and introducing the idea of human behavior. In the very first lecture itself what we did was we looked at what is human behavior. So the definition of human behavior and as we said in that lecture that behavior is any action that humans take and these actions are the result of a stimulus or I would say a change on the internal or external environment. So any kind of change in the external environment environment produces a reaction by an individual and that reaction is called a behavior. In behaviorist psychology, we call this as the SR learning where there is a stimulus giving a response or a stimulus invoking a response. So the first lecture itself we discussed what is this behavior and what is the need of study of this behavior. We discussed reasons why we should study human behavior and then we focused on that if you study human behavior since psychology is a stochastic science, it is a science which is based on probabilities and randomness because it is very difficult to predict what anybody is going to do. Unlike the deterministic science which are the hard sciences where positions and actions can be determined, psychology is a stochastic science, a probabilistic science where behaviors or human actions cannot be determined with well developed laws and so to study what a human does or a, how a human reacts to any situation the best idea is to use the science of psychology because that science gives you methods and tools to study human behavior. So we started up by defining what is behavior, we started up by looking at why we should study behavior and the reason that I gave is because uh, if, if we cannot predict people's behavior uh, with certain probability then the success that we have in our life in any dimension whether it is uh, solving a problem or, or any achieving a particular goal 
predicting others' behavior will also help us develop our social world, having a better life and all kind of pleasures, all kind of satisfaction humans would get. And so that was one of the reasons why we would study behavior. So we started off by looking at the nature of psychology. What is psychology? What is the science of psychology? And we saw how psychology, the science which studies human behavior, it developed from both philosophy, questions like the origin of behavior, questions like whether uh, nature or nurture, whether genetics or uh, learning has a role in development of the human mind, the concept of the human mind, the concept of the human soul, the idea that whether at, at the time of birth human brain is completely blank or does it come with some kind of information or other practical questions in philosophy, uh, those gave rise to the science of psychology. We also looked at the idea or that physiology, uh, the study of human's body, that also provided a support or that also led to the development of the science of psychology because uh, for studying human behavior we have to study how human beings uh, work and for that you have to understand the anatomy and, and the physiology of human body, how the working of the human body is and for that matter one of the historical origins of psychology has been uh, physiology. So, we looked at how physiology helps in development of uh, psychology. We started off by looking at the earliest schools, the earlier conceptualization of psychology where we discussed the idea of what is structuralism, which is uh, one school of psychology which says that if you want to study human behavior, you have to break it into its uh, separate parts. Now, this school of psychology since it has its impetus, it is coming from Wundt school, uh, who William Wundt by the way was the father of psychology who, dis who started the uh, study of experimental psychology or I would say scientific psychology. And so, he was coming from the hard sciences, so he believed that behaviors could be studied by breaking uh, the human behavior into its constituent parts in terms of what is psychological and what is uh, physiological. And so, here you would remember the concept of uh, a cold lemonade that I gave you uh, in, in that lecture. So, basically structuralists believe that study of human behavior requires uh, dividing the behavior or breaking the behavior into its part. In opposition to that, the gestaltist said that human behavior cannot be studied by breaking the whole behavior into its constituent parts, rather the whole behavior itself and parts of the behavior will have different meanings and that is why they gave the conceptualization of uh, how the sum is different from the sum of parts is, or the whole is different from different parts combined together. And so, uh, this was a direct opposition to what structuralism was. Then another school of psychology which is called behaviorism was proposed which proposed that if you want to study uh, human behavior you have to see the behavior in continuity, you have to see the behavior actually happening. Further to it we had the science of behaviorism which said that human behavior occurs uh, because there are certain well learned responses. So, human beings in, in presence of a stimulus act in a certain way and if acting in a certain way is rewarding for them, is giving them some kind of a benefit, they learn these associations, they learn this act that if a particular stimulus for example, if somebody shouts at you and you shout them back and because of you shouting them back they run away. So, you learn that shouting back at shouting people is a good habit and so that, that is how you learn behavior and that is how you develop behavior. So, that was what the behaviorist thought. Further to it we had the psychoanalytic view which believed that human behavior basically develops from the unconscious, the human mind is basically unconscious and there are desires and, and hidden motives and everything stored in this unconscious and that drives the human behavior. Then we looked at the historical origin psychology and that is why I was discussing this schools of psychology. Further to it, we looked at different psychological perspectives. So, studying the same behavior, studying any behavior can be done by different perspectives. For example, if somebody uh, gets angry, now this act of getting angry uh, when somebody curses you or somebody talks to you loudly can be explained by different perspectives and so there are various perspectives in psychology. If from a biological point of view, this getting angry is basically coming from evolution. Uh, it is from the evolutionary point of view. From the biological point of view, this getting angry comes from the interplay of neurotransmitters. So, certain time of neurotransmitters force you to get angry. And from a cognitive point of view, 
by thinking about the situation that somebody shouting at you, uh, they tap your previous experiences and memory and, and you come to know that when they are shouting at you obviously it means that they are not happy at you and so if they are not happy at you and you have not done anything wrong, so shouting back at them your past experiences says is, is going to uh, prove you know, worthy of it and so you basically bark back at them or shout back at them and then that is how the cognitive perspective believes. So, there are four or five different cognitive perspectives uh, which we discuss and these cognitive perspectives perspectives are various ways which can explain human behavior. And lastly, we looked at how psychological research is done. So, within the uh, psychological perspectives, we also saw some newer dimensions of psychology. For example, the idea of cognitive neuroscience, the idea of uh, psycholinguistics, how these new schools or the uh, idea of neuropsychology. So, how these new schools have come up and how they are explaining now the human behavior. And later in the lecture, we looked at or how is psychological research done. So, we looked at four or five different methods. We started by looking at what is experimentation and uh, how this experimentation uh, is done using an independent variable and a dependent variable and so and using control and uh, experimental groups. So, something like that and then we looked at doing research using the correlational method. So, in correlational method, although there are two variables, variable 1 and variable 2 and they are related to each other, but it is very difficult to say whether variable 1 causes variable 2. So, it is basically a bidirectional reaction, which means that whenever a variable 1 changes in some way, variable 2 also changes, but there is no direct cause and effect relationship. So, when I say cause and effect relationship, it does not prove, this relations does not prove whether 1 leads to 2 or 2 leads to 1, I, I do not know, it is a both way uh, kind of an act. And we looked at several other methodologies of studying human behavior, for example, using observation and uh, using uh, the idea of literature review and this kind of uh, case studies and this kind of methodologies to study human behavior. So, in the first section itself, we looked at these uh, introductions of how human behavior is. Now, when once we know that people react to stimuluses and so behavior comes from a certain stimulus. So, people react to stimuluses. So, basically then there is something that we have to learn uh, that is how these stimuluses or change in the external environment. coded. So, the stimulus change or the stimulus how it is coded in the behavioral system. Now, human beings there are two dimensions that we have to look at. One is called the physical dimension. This is where everything outside of us is and this is called the psychological dimension. This is inside of us. So, how change in, in something which is outside of us. For example, the wind blows and because of that the leaves they start moving and because of that a cool breeze blows and this cool breeze makes you feel cold and you start wearing a jacket. So, this idea that the wind blowing and making the producing this cold wind which actually makes you feel the loss of temperature, how is this coded, this sensation coded into the psychological realm and for that any kind of change in the external environment, how this is encoded into the psychological domain is happening through a set of process and a set of systems and these process systems combined together are known as sensory system and sensory processes. So, next we looked at what is sensory modality and what are the different sensory modalities that humans have. Now, of course, the humans have five different sensory modalities starting from the eye to the ear and then you have the smell, taste and skin. So, these are the five different sensory modalities meaning which that each of these have receptors which can take in information from the external environment and code this information into the psychological domain and these based on these codings human beings react or make certain actions. So, uh, next we looked at the idea of this sensory modality, how the sensory modality really functions and so within that we looked at the idea of what is sensitivity and sensory coding. Now, in any sensory system any sensory receptors have to have certain properties. Now, one of the properties the sensory system has to have is called sensitivity. The more 
sensitive or sensory receptor is the better chances for it to detect changes in the external environment and the sensitivity is then explained in terms of threshold and signal detection theory. Now, sensitivity of a system is measured in terms of whether it can detect something called the absolute and the differential threshold. Now, what is the absolute threshold? The absolute threshold is that minimum amount of change in the external environment which makes a sensory system by detecting it say that there is a change from no stimulus to yes stimulus, from a zero stimulus to one stimulus and so that is what is called absolute alignment or absolute threshold. Now, in comparison to that there is another threshold which is called the differential threshold. So, we have something called the absolute threshold and we have something called the differential threshold. So, this differential threshold is the minimum amount of change in a stimulus uh, which has been detected by the sensory system so that people can see the next change. So, if I have two units of something and a one unit change is done onto it and if I cannot notice this change then it will not be uh, set to possessing differential threshold. So, differential threshold is that amount of change or uh, that amount of increase in the intensity of a stimulus so that it can be detected uh, once uh, the absolute threshold has been established and this is called the differential threshold. So, basically the idea of absolute threshold and differential threshold is what defines a sensitivity. So, can first of all if I am thinking of in terms of electrical current or if I am thinking of in terms of a multimeter and if I am looking at electricity how, how electricity is measured. So, first of all the first thing is how do we define this multimeter is working. The first is the sensitivity of the multimeter and that is defined in terms of whether the multimeter can detect changes from 0 current to 1 current, 0 current to some voltage of current or 0 current to uh, let us say 0 0.00001 uh, volts of current. Now, if it can do that the lowest uh, number that it can detect the highest sensitivity it can do. So, first thing is when if it can change it can detect the change from no current to yes current and the second thing is can it detect further changes in subsequent changes in current. So, can it detect uh, change between 1 volt to 2 volt and if it can that is called the change from 1 volt to 2 volt and 2 volt to 3 volt is called differential threshold and the change from 0 volt to 1 volt or 0 volt to 0 0.0000001 volt is what is called the absolute threshold. Then we defined out uh, what is called signal detection theory and signal detection theory basically is nothing it is the process of how we can detect signals or extract signals from noises. Now, we know there are several kinds of noises the noises could be in terms of external environment, the noises could be in terms of internal human noises which the brain produces. So, in presence of these external internal noises, how human beings detect uh, changes in external environment is what is the idea of signal detection theory and we have discussed in detail. So, go back to that lecture and then have a look at it. Then we looked at sensory coding which is how these informations which has this, this idea of concept of threshold and detection, how these sensory systems actually in terms of the biology of it register these changes into the human uh, brain and that happens by coding for intensity and quantity. So, the sensory receptors which is the eye, the ear and the taste, smell, taste and skin they detect changes in uh, the intensity and quality of uh, information, quality of uh, information which is falling onto it. So, the rate at which an information is falling and the and the amount of information which is falling on any sensory receptor is basically coded in terms of in, in intensity and quality. And uh, then we looked at how the sensory receptors actually while uh, taking this information how the sensory receptors function. Further to it we took a classical system which is called the vision and we looked at how colors, patterns and theory of color vision. So, uh, we looked at the eye, human eye and we looked at how this human eye uh, takes in information and produces the idea of color, produces the idea of pattern uh, viewing, color viewing and we lo looked at uh, many different theories of uh, this vision. Now, once uh, some information has been processed, some so uh, once the sensory systems has encoded changes in stimulus, the, a meaning has to be given to it and this meaning is given to it through a process of perception. So, what is it? So, we looked at two theories of perception, one theory of perception says that in terms of the visual perception, so basically I would say it is visual perception. So, one theory of visual perception says that which is called the Gibsonian model and Gibsonian model says that information which is falling onto the eye is enough for producing all kind of perceptions and then there is the combined view which says that it is not so uh, information which is falling into the eye plus information processing 
both combine together to form perception. So, it is not only that information which is the light rays which is falling on your eye is enough to make meaning of what the external stimulus is. You also need your past experiences, memory and all kind of processing through the brain to understand what a stimulus means. And then we looked at the five different functions of perception. So, starting with attention which is the first step in perception where anybody puts his cognitive resources or people put their cognitive resources in full in grabbing what the external stimulus has to send to them. So, the sensory systems has a lot of information with it, a lot of information is falling onto it. So, attention is the process of putting filters. So, attention is the process of putting filters onto those number of information which is falling onto the sensory system and through the process of attention we pick only necessary information. Now, once this necessary information is picked up, an idea of localization or the process of localization starts where we start locating or where we start putting what stimulus or where this stimulus is in the external environment. Now, once we know what stimulus is and where this is, we can make meaning out of it. This will help us in moving through the environment, which will also help us in uh, knowing what kind of stimulus it is and navigating the social path. So, we start this process of localization by using both the binocular and the monocular cues. So, two eye cues and one eye cues. So, please go back to that uh, section on perception and have a look at how this really works. Then the third process is called recognition. This is the actual process of making meaning. So, uh, after localization and attention, we have grabbed stimuluses and we have grabbed the stimulus and also located them in the external environment or we have been able to uh, perceive what is the background and what is the foreground and all kind of other informations regarding the uh, stimuluses. Now, all these informations are combined together for example, perception of form, perception of color, perception of distance, object symmetry and all those things have been uh, grabbed by attention and localization, depth and all those things have been grabbed. And so, by that the process of recognition takes this information, all these information together and then projects a uh, scheme or makes a meaning of what this stimulus is compared in terms of what information is coming from uh, the sensory systems and also from previous learning or from your memory. So, those informations, information from the sensory system and information from the memory, they are combined together to form the actual perception and this happens at the recognition phase. Now, while doing recognition, two things are considered or two things are uh, held constant. One is called abstraction. So, whenever I am looking at any information from the external systems, what we do is we abstract information which means that we make or we only take the necessary parts of stimuli which is needed for recognition. So, if we are looking at a human face for example, the most important part that we need is not where the eye, the mouth and the nose is. There are two eyes and, and one nose and that kind of information is not needed. Any special feature here, for example, a cut here or, or something else that is noted because the idea of the human face is already there stored in, in the human memory. So, we only need the special feature and because of that we can identify the face. So, that is the process of abstraction and the process of constancy says that there are certain things which are constant which the brain assumes, pre-assumes. So, somebody coming from far towards you does not change shape because you have the idea of constancy. The brain has this idea of constancy which means that things certain things remain constant. So, uh, whatever angle you turn uh, something into there is a factor of constancy which makes the image perceivable or make uh, meaningful. Then we looked at what is learning and how this idea of learning really works. So, learning has been uh, defined as a relatively permanent change in behavior which is happening through experience. So, relatively which means that it is relative to something. So, learning for learning to occur there has to be some experience previously and in previous to that experience when you are gathering some new information that is what is called learning. So, it is relatively then it is called the relative is permanent. So, it is relatively permanent which means that if you learn something it can also be unlearned. For example, there are certain habits that you have learned while you started living alone after graduating or after passing out of your high school when you are now in your colleges you know, there are certain kind of habits for example, getting up late and other things. But once you get in your jobs all these habits will go away and so this learning that you have done of becoming late or becoming lazy all those learning will go away and that is why it is called relatively permanent. And what is that a relative permanent change in behavior? So, this is a change in behavior earlier you were getting up early and studying and now you are not doing it or whatever kind of change which is there. So, learning has been formed in uh, this way or learning is the process which describes this. Now, this learning has two parts one is called the uh, 
non-associative form. In the non-associative form, generally we look at single stimulus learning and in the associative form, what we do is that multiple stimuluses, so uh, more than one stimulus, multiple stimulus combine with each other to form learning or to make you learn certain things. Now, single stimulus learning, there are two types, one is called the habits and the other is called the sensitization. So, we have discussed both this and in terms of the associative form, we have something called the observation learning, we have something called the classical conditioning and we have something called the observational operant learning. Now, in the sensitization, what happens in, uh, in the habituation, what happens is uh, that in a, it is a response to innocuous stimulus where your response decreases. So, imagine that your friend uh, is there and so what he does is to uh, make you angry or uh, to make you fearful when you enter your room he blows a horn and so the first time, second time, third time he can make you a fool but after that you are expecting that and so you do not become uh, that much uh, afraid. Now, the same stimulus so that is called the habituation because later on uh, you are habituated to that particular sound. Now, in sensitization what happens is the same horn if it is used in a context context uh, where if you are going in a, in a dark place and the same horn is, is blown, the amount of fear that you had shown previously, it will it will shoot up and that is called sensitization. So, the increase in your fear, the, this behavior of fear or running away, that basically in a conducive environment is what is called sensitization. Now, in terms of classical con conditioning, operant conditioning and observation learning, now what happens in classical conditioning? In classical conditioning, a neutral stimulus a stimulus which does not produce any response that is paired, this neutral stimulus is paired with a unconditioned stimulus to give a response. Now, what is an unconditioned stimulus? Unconditioned so for in for our purpose, meat produces salivation. So, what I do is if this meat is added with a tone and if we do that multiple number of times and this, saliv uh, this salivation is the response. So, what will happen is after 100 or like, let us say 1000 pairings, this tone will produce salivation. Now, in classical conditioning, we have looked at various factors of how this whole process really works. We have looked at the cognitive meaning of it, the uh, the underlying process of how this expectation uh, leads to this kind of behavior, the idea about extinction, the idea about uh, spontaneous recovery and so many other things that we have looked at. So, go back to that uh, section and read it. In operant conditioning what happens is you do a, part a particular stimulus gives a particular kind of a response. Now, if a person produces a response and because of this response you get a positive consequence, then this behavior will be increased, but if the consequence is negative, this behavior is decreased. So, in, in terms of classical conditioning, a reward is given beforehand to produce a response, but in terms of operant conditioning, a response, if it leads to a positive consequence, the response is learned again or it is executed again, but if a response leads to negative consequences, it is not initiated again and that is what is operant conditioning. So, we look at factors of operant conditioning, we look at several other variables related to operant conditioning, we looked at the dynamics of operant conditioning and so on and so forth. So, have a look at that particular section and then finally, we looked at observation observation learning, which is the kind of learning in which you see someone, a role model and you see that role model doing something and, and you copy that behavior and by, by copying that behavior, you actually tend to get the best response or tend to get satisfied and so you copy that behavior or you copy people's behavior which produces a uh, good output or which produces satisfactory output. So, that is called operational learning and that is what we did in learning. Now, once something has been learned, informations have been learned, new information has been gathered, they have to be saved somewhere and that is what is the process of memory. So, in memory we looked at how the information which has been learned through learning, so information learned, how they are stored or where they are stored and what kind of information which is stored and the process of memory is a three part process. It has something called encoding which is how information is uh, sent into the human brain, then the idea of storage which is how it is stored and the idea of retrieval if, of uh, memory which is how information is retrieved from human memory. So, there are two views of memory, the first view is called the Atkinson and Schifrin model, Atkinson and Schifrin model which believes that memory is like a, there are different storehouses and memory 
uh, human memory uh, keeps information within the storehouses and there are something called active processes which move information from one storehouse to the other storehouse. In comparison to that in a direct opposition to that there is something called the parallel process model of memory or the parallel processing model neural network model of memory which says that human memory is not about these uh, structures or these processes there are different processes or there are different systems which work at the same time in human memory. So, it is not about uh, certain stores and certain processes carrying information from one store to the another. Many processes act at the same time uh, across several stores to produce memory and that is what the, the neural network model is. Now, there was a concept of working memory which we have looked at and so working memory is a newest conceptualization of short term memory which uses something called Craig and Lockhart's model and says that memory is nothing but the, the how information moves from one uh, part of memory or one layer of memory to the other layer of memory from short term to long term is dependent on how much rehearsal has been done, how much action has been done on that information. Now, if you do something called maintenance rehearsal, information stays in working memory and it floats away and but if you do something called elaborate rehearsal, information moves from the short term memory to long term memory. Also, for the first time working memory gives the conceptualization that different kind of information which is earlier what we believed is all kind of information is encoded in the same memory structure. So, there is one memory structure in which the acoustic information, the semantic information, the visual information everything goes uh, in the same place. Now, for the first time what has happened is working memory gives a conceptualization that there is something called a central executive and this central executive is then connected to something called the phonological loop and the visual schedule. Uh, sketch pad. So, visual and spatial information move to the visual spatial sketch pad and uh, the acoustic information moves to something called the phonological loop and between them lies something called the episodic buffer which integrates information from both these things uh, the both these uh, stores and then talks to LTM memory and borrows rule for it for processing information. The central executive is the process which makes all this happen and so that is the conceptualization of the working memory. Now, we also looked at how this long term memory is divided into two parts one is called the episodic and and the other is called semantic. Now, episodic what kind of information is stored? All episode relation information, all events in your life is stored in the episodic memory and in the semantic memory you have information related to truth, rules, procedures, uh, facts, all those information are stored in semantic memory. So, it is a good thing to go back to that lecture and have a look at how, how we looked at. And the finally, we looked at how information is lost. So, how do you forget? And so, we looked at the idea of interference and active decay, they lead to forgetting. We looked at also something called false memory. Now, I have already said that memory is never accurate and so the conceptualization of memory construction and memory construction and memory addition these leads to the idea of false memory. So, memories are never accurate because if similar information is given to you it and it fits the schema uh, in which your memory is lying what will happen is this information will be taken it is embedded together and you will get a new kind of memory and so memories should never be trusted and the idea that false memory which means that uh, new memories can always be generated. So, memories uh, distortion and memories uh, construction. So, memories can be both distorted and it could new information could be added into it. So, memories that you have can be distorted in ways by putting more new information or more information to it to it or memories can be constructed. So, whatever memory you have if you put new information to it a new memory altogether will come out and that is called the idea of false memory. Now, once we have done that we looked at what is language and thought. So, uh, once we have new information with us once we have information stored somewhere uh, new information stored somewhere new knowledge stored somewhere this knowledge has to be communicated between people. So, if I do a particular behavior to a particular act and that is rewarding I should convey this information to other people. So, how do I convey this information by using something called language. So, there is a practical difference between language and communication and the difference is that communication is uh, a way of expressing ideas bit, but it is very limited in nature and uh, in opposition to that in language we have certain rules and so many kind of information many types of information many forms of information can be expressed through language. So, whereas communication is very restrictive language on the other hand is very progressive. So, basically all kind of information all kind of thoughts all kind of uh, information can be passed on between people. So, we to, we look at the English language, we looked at the idea of how phonology or phones and uh, the phonemes, the morphemes, the sentence, the word and uh, the idea of uh, syntax 
how all these together they form the idea of language. So, we looked at all of these and, and how this language really functions and how the language comprises of all these parts. So, uh, you should actually go back to that particular uh, lecture and start looking at that. Then we looked at concepts and categorization. We looked at the how the human brain uh, takes this information whatever has been there and they categorize and, and they uh, form concepts out of it. We looked at how the concepts is formed. So, the idea of any concept for example, the idea of the apple. So, we looked at how semantic memory or the semantic memory tree concept which was pr proposed by Quellin and Quinns, how that is used for conceptualization and categorization of new information. So, that information stays intact and more information can be added to previous stored information. Then we looked at two kinds of reasoning of once you have information with you and once this information can be communicated and you are able to categorize new information, any kind of new information into pre-existing categories into the mind, the idea of reasoning comes in. Reasoning gives you a power of thinking, a power of making decisions, a power of uh, analyzing information. And so, there are two kinds of reasoning, one is called the logical reasoning, the other is called the imaginal reasoning. Within the logical reasoning, you have something called the deductive reasoning and you have something called the inductive reasoning. Now, in deductive reasoning what happens is a lot of information is given from to you and from that. So, coming from general to specific is what is called deductive reasoning. So, you use certain kind of logic and certain kind of uh, reasoning analogies and based on that from you come from detail, you come from general information to specific information and that is called the deductive reasoning. You deduce something and inductive reasoning from the specific if you want to go to general from a specific bit of information if you want to go to general, generalize this out, uh, information, if you want to predict things, if you want to come up with future predictions, what type of reasoning that you use is you use inductive reasoning. And so, within that we have discussed all kinds of reasoning paradigms, conditional reasonings and, and all kind of uh, things into it. The if p then q kind of a format and, and many other kind of formats that we have uh, looked into. So, the idea would be to go back to and actually look at that particular thing. Now, in relation to this kind of a logic based reasoning, we also use something called imaginal reasoning. Sometimes logic based reasoning does not work. So, we have to use our imagination for reasoning. For example, all those questions in which you have to rotate something, spatial rotation or you have to imagine something in terms of uh, movements uh, or if you have to imagine moving from one place to another. In those cases, we use something called imaginal scanning and imaginal reasoning. We do not use logic, we use our imagination to come up with reasons or to come up with why something has happened. And lastly, we looked at thinking and problem solving. Thinking being the process of using reasoning to come up with valid reasons and uh, making decisions on top of it and problem solving the process of how a particular problem is solved. So, we defined what is problem solving. I uh, use the idea of something called Newell's method of how we divide a bigger problem into smaller problems and then try solving this smaller problem. So, if this is a bigger problem what we do is we use something called the Newell approach in which what, what we do is we divide this bigger problem into smaller problems which can be solved. And so, this is pro the bigger problem is this is the I the O and this is I 1 O 1 which is the output here which is the final solution here uh, for this smaller problem. From this we will solve this problem here from here here and then we have a final solution for this problem and so this kind of a approach of how uh, we solve problems. We discussed how experts and novices solve problems and we, we looked at that kind of thing also. Next, we discussed the idea of what is intelligence. We looked at the nature of intelligence, how intelligence has been defined as a special ability of uh, differentiating between peoples, the idea of how whether intelligence is one single factor with a couple of multiple factors, couple of specific factors or whether intelligence is specific factors combined together to give intelligence. Now, the single factor approach says that there is something called a general intelligence which is present in everyone and based on that you can measure intelligence. The specific factor of intelligence says that intelligence is not measured by one specific one general factor, there are specific factors and everybody has a specific types of intelligence or everybody is, is uh, competent or intelligent in one specific domain. Now, there are theories of intelligence that we discussed. So, we looked at Anderson's information processing theory, we looked at uh, the idea of how uh, Stenberg's triarchy theory works, we looked at Gardner's theory, we looked at several other theories of intelligence of how they define what is intelligence and what is a intelligence process. We looked at uh, the idea of validity and uh, uh, the idea of uh, reliability and how this validity and reliability actually help in designing a intelligence test. And we looked at the idea of how IQ which is mental age by chronological age 
into 100 which defines our intelligence. Lastly, we took a model system which is emotional intelligence, how people manage their own emotions and how managing these emotions make them a better person and how creativity is related to emotional intelligence that is what we focused into the end of this lecture. Further, we looked at the idea of what is emotions. So, emotions as we discuss are specific uh, responses of humans and in terms of certain changes in stimuli. So, we discussed what is emotion and how what is the difference between emotion and mood and there we discussed that emotion is a specific process and it is uh, relevant to one stimuli and it is it peaks in a very specific time frame whereas mood stays for a longer duration of time and there is no specific stimulus where it is related to. So, emotions and moods differ in dif different ways. Now, we looked at the theories of emotions. So, we looked at something called the James Lang theory which says that first we feel afraid, a physiological arousal happens, then we cognitively feel. So, first the physiology comes, then the thinking comes and then we run. So, if a bear is here, we first feel the afraidness, then we think the afraidness and then we run. Now, we also looked at something called the Cannon and Bart theory which says that if a bear is in front of us, we feel the fear and uh, physiologically and mentally also we feel the fear at the same time and we run. Then we have something called the Sachter and Singer theory which basically says that we see a bear, first we do something called cognitive appraisal. We actually decide whether this bear is of worth fearing or not and based on that then the physiology and then the, uh, the thinking part comes in and then we run. Now, we looked at the multiple component uh, theory of uh, emotion which says that emotion starts with a person interaction environment. So, there is a person interaction environment leading to something called primary uh, appraisal which leads to something called subjective feelings which leads to thinking uh, thoughts and the thought process and thinking in, in ways related to uh, what the appraisal is and then there is something called bodily reactions. This leads to facial expressions and finally a response. So, we looked at these in detail and finally we looked at emotion regulation once the emotion sets in how do we disperse, how do we get rid of this emotion though there, there is a behavioral way and there is a cognitive way of getting out uh, of this emotion and the process could be both in terms of engagement and disengagement and engagement. So, we looked at this chart of how to get rid of emotions or how to control our own emotions. Then finally, we looked at the concept of personality. We described the nature of personality of what is personality. So, this is uh, a relatively uh, stable pattern of behavior that people show across situations and how this leads to people showing different kind of acts and how this leads to different kind of processing in people and different kind of behaviors. Then we saw different theories of uh, personality. We looked at the idea of Freud who describes personality not only as uh, in terms of the unconscious and the conscious and subconscious but also thinks of personality in terms of the ego, the id and the superego and also thinks of personality in terms of how uh, the stages of development uh, happen and in terms of defense mechanism or in terms of how uh, managing of uh, the anxiety is taking place. We also looked at the humanistic theorist which is Carl Rogers and others and who believe that it is about self-actualization which leads to personality dynamics. We looked at the learning theories which believe that personality is caused by learning and conditioning. So, what you learn and by learning something, uh, if you are rewarded in a certain way, you develop that response and that matter of response and that basically uh, changes your personality or changes your pattern of behavior in a certain way and that, that affects and finally that affects your personality. So, we looked at how learning theories define personality. So, we looked at the Freud theory, we looked at humanistic theory, we looked at learning theories. We also looked at something called the trait theories of personality which describes that personality is dependent on certain stable traits or stable patterns of behavior that people display when they are behaving on and uh, these type of traits are called there are certain type of traits which are called secondary traits, the primary traits and then we have something called the central traits. So, this is how traits are basically a pattern of behavior that people have. So, go back to that lecture and you will be understanding what I am talking about. And then finally, we looked at how personality assesses. So, we looked at the questionnaire method where we looked at the MMPI as a personality inventory. We looked at something called 
all uh, the projective techniques where we discuss in detail the Rorschach technique, we discuss in detail the TAT technique and uh, several other techniques of machining personality using ambiguous figures or ambiguous surfaces which can generate meaning. And finally, we looked at the idea of how the newer methods of personality are used for example, brain dynamics and interviews are used for measuring personalities. Lastly, we had the section on uh, social influence and social cognition and up till now what we have done is we have looked at how the individual himself causes his behavior, but people's behavior is also dependent on people outside of him. And so, this chapter was necessary to explain how other people influence our behavior. So, we looked at what is social thought, we looked at something called attributions, how we give meaning to other people's uh, behavior and how that leads to certain kind of biases and our change in behavior. We looked at social cognition, which is how people perceive information about other people how people perceive what other people uh, do and think. So, uh, here we looked at something called correspondence bias and so on and so forth, we looked at what is attribution and here we looked at things like contrafactual thinking. Once a thing has already been occurred, how we think in terms of what should have occurred and what should not have occurred. We looked at in terms of certain other biases uh, which are there, for example, accepting in terms of others accepting or finding information which match people's personality and that way uh, this kind of biases can result from social cognition. We looked at the idea of social behavior of how we behave in certain situations. In social uh, cognition we also looked at something called attitudes. Attitude is how uh, people think about certain situations. So, we looked at the concept of what an attitude is, we looked at the concept of how this attitude change happens in terms of persuasions and cognitive dissonance using the direct and the indirect method of uh, changing attitudes. We looked at social behaviors in there, we looked at what are called prejudices and how does prejudice de define people's behavior and we looked at the concept of stereotypes, how stereotypes also define our behavior and how these stereotypes and prejudice can be lessened. Last we looked at is something called social influences, we looked at the idea of what is called obedience uh, which is basically obeying a certain authority, the idea of compliance how we comply to people's request and people's situation and that kind of a so compliance obedience and conformity conformity is when a number of group of people are uh, basically supporting a reason how we conform to them or how we let go of our thought process and agree to other people remember ashes experiment where we actually agree to other people and we comply to or we conform to their decision and lastly we looked at what is attraction and love we looked at the idea of uh, romantic love and how this romantic love really functions and how this romantic love and attraction defines our behavior. So, all in all in this lecture what we have done is we have looked at several processes. We started off by defining what is behavior, right? How do human beings behave? So, till the last lecture just before the last lecture we looked at a number of individual factors which affect human behavior starting from uh, the idea of sensation to how we perceive things to how emotions can change our behavior the way we behave to uh, the idea of how personality can be a major factor in changing people's behavior to how uh, your intelligence can be changing your behavior also what processes that you use in making meaning of external stimuli can change your behavior, what you learn can change your behavior and how learning can change your behavior, how storing something and the way you store something or what factors can actually uh, make what information you store and that in turn can, can change your behavior. So, we looked at uh, those kind of things also how we communicate information. So, if I, uh, if information is miscommunicated, if the wrong information is com communicated, a wrong type of behavior can be evaluated. If you categorize something in the wrong manner, a wrong type of behavior could be generated and a lot of factors which can actually look at uh, uh, how behavior changes happen or how behavior is, is studied. In the last chapter, we looked at how other people or our uh, interpretations of other people can change our whole uh, behavior. For example, how we comply to people's requests, how we are obedient to other people's requests, how we process information from other people, how attribution which is giving meaning to other people's acts uh, changes our behavior and so on and so forth. So, in all, the 
lecture, the, the course was designed into looking at, as I promised to you, the course was designed into looking at how uh, we study human behavior, how we study people's actions and, and what can we interpret into it. And what I have done to this course is given you a number of tools, a number of reasons, a number of processes through which you can see uh, people's behavior. I have also given uh, you large number of factors which can be part of people's behavior and how you can spot these factors. For example, if somebody acts in a in a very weird way. Now, and, and if you're looking at his face, you can think that he is uh, emotional right now, he's afraid right now, and that is why he's acting. So, your interpretation of his behavior will be different. If somebody is angry, your response towards him will be different by looking at how we have defined how emotions can affect behavior. Similarly, what somebody says to you or uh, how you see things uh, that in, or how you process information from the social world or how you process information from the external world, all these information will also define human behavior. With this course, you will be able to uh, not only handle your own uh, perceptions about other people, but you will also think about those reasons. Now, you can, you can appreciate why people are different, why people behave differently. It is not just the process of simple stimulus response. It is uh, people differ because people see things differently. The same object as we saw in the chapter of perception in terms of illusion, the same object can be perceived as different things. There are something called reversible figures. Now, in reversible figures, two people will see two different things. Now, it is because they are seeing different things. And why do they see different things? They are seeing different things because the eyes, their eyes are actually forming two different views. The background and foreground has been processed in different ways. Similarly, your past experiences can actually bias your way of thinking. Now, not only can your internal factors of who you are, in what state you are, what kind of personality you are, what kind of thinking you require, what kind of intelligence you are, all those things will define your behavior and other people's behavior. It is other people also in presence of you, for example, the idea of social facilitation. Now, what is social facilitation? Social facilitation is a concept in psychology which basically says that when you compete with other people, you tend to behave differently, you tend to behave better. But when you are uh, working alone, you tend to behave poorer. So, when you, when you sit with more people, your progress will improve and this is called social facilitation. Now, these people may not be doing the same work that you are, but just by the presence of other people whom you think are evaluating you, you work in a different way. And so, that way your behavior changes. So, not only the internal factors like personality, intelligence and perception, memory would change your behavior, it is also other people around you that can change your behavior. And so, now you would be able to appreciate the idea of how these things, these factors that we have looked at in this particular course, how they can shape people's behavior. So, uh, by the end of this course, I am pretty sure that you would be able to appreciate how complex is human behavior, how complex is human actions and what kind of consideration should be given before giving reasons to people's behavior or interpreting other people. And by the knowledge that you have gained by this course, I am pretty sure you would have a better understanding of people's behavior, of people's action and this knowledge will also help you shape your own actions towards them which will lead to far better benefits which will lead to far better situations. Now, uh, there are some portions in this particular lecture which are also covered in my other course on cognitive psychology, introduction to cognitive psychology. For example, the chapter on uh, sensation, perception, uh, learning, memory, thinking and problem solving all these have been covered in detail in the chapter on cognitive psychology or in the course on uh, introduction to cognitive psychology. So, if you are following that course as well, because both courses run are parallel in this time, if you are following that course uh, as well, you will get a better idea of what I am talking about. You will get in detail, you understand in detail the processes that I have uh, not covered in detail in this course because that was not required. But if you want to study more, if you want to study further of how this process really works, for example, how does language really work? Now, if you want to cover that, uh, two or three lectures are there on introduction to cognitive psychology which just touch language. We just look at how language helps you in, uh, in communication or in passing ideas, information storage and so on and so forth. There are three or four chapters on memory which look at all the distinctions of memory which are there. So, my suggestion to you would be you start following that course as well and that will help you a lot. 
So, at the end before we wrap up this course or this uh, last lecture on this course, um, what I believe from my side is that this course would have actually helped you in understanding human behavior and not only understanding behavior but also shaping your own responses or shaping your own uh, acts towards other people and giving people due consideration of why they do, what they do and how you should act in front of them. So. Uh, all the very best for your examinations and I hope uh, very good luck to you for examinations. Thank you and goodbye.